takes a while for people to see the impacts. Uh, but we've put universities, universities fundamentally on a path to growth. Uh, we've created a demand-driven system. So uh, it's not a question of a capped pool of places and kids lucky enough to get a place out of the cap. Uh, places will follow student demand on a path to growth. And I am particularly proud of the fact uh, that the incentive money we put in uh, to partner with schools and to generate enrolments from kids from low SES backgrounds, combined with our student income support changes, which were incredibly controversial at the time, uh, are driving uh, changes about who gets to university. When I embarked on those reforms, I was told, um, you know, it can't change the prospect of poor kids getting into university because it all goes wrong for them back in kindy and school. And I acknowledge we've got to get kindy and school right and we've got huge reforms agenda, uh, agendas there. But I said, I think there are some things we can do. Uh, so we've dangled money in front of uh, the smartest people in the nation, the people who work in universities, and we've said, if you can get poor kids into your university, you can have this money. And the smartest people in the nation have worked out how to do it. Uh, so, for example, last time I saw Glenn from the University of Melbourne, he said the, uh, of this year's undergraduate cohort at the University of Melbourne, 25% of them are from low SES backgrounds. Now, people would have told you that wasn't possible. Prestige University, poor kids getting a go. Well, it is possible, and the uni reform agenda is making it possible. So, yes, there's more to do, but uh, big changes are driving um, opportunity in our society. And, you know, I think per capita obviously spends a lot of its time thinking about the uh, big picture challenges for the future. We spend a lot of our time doing it too. Uh, and it seems to me that and the things that I've spoken about today are good examples of the modern social democratic project. Uh, which is about spreading opportunity fairly and also sharing risk fairly. Just before we turn to the audience for, for a few questions, Prime Minister, um, to what extent do governments have a, a moral obligation, a moral responsibility perhaps, to limit inequality, even if that comes at the expense of some economic growth? Uh, I think uh, we've certainly uh, got a moral uh, obligation to... Uh, to make sure people don't get left behind, that there aren't uh, people on the margins of our society with no hope and no prospects. And I think Australians have stepped up to that uh, moral obligation. For example, the dialogue now about offering a, uh, a chance and inclusion to Indigenous Australians is a better dialogue than we've had at any other time in our nation's history. And uh, many uh, business people in this room, including Cause, play a great role in that themselves as uh, part of uh, changing the life prospects of Indigenous Australians. Uh, but I actually think we're in the happy situation where there's a virtuous circle here, uh, where the right thing from your moral code is actually the right thing from your economic handbook um, it's a, a much better economic result for us uh, to have Australians who would have left, led lives of quiet despair on welfare in excluded parts of the country in society's mainstream, uh, earning, embraced, making the choices you and I take for granted. Will we buy that pair of shoes? Will we go and have a cup of coffee? Uh, things that uh, many people don't have the wherewithal to make as a lifetime choice now. Uh, so we can change what it is for them to experience uh, being an Australian at the same time as we can improve our economy because of their work efforts. Mm. Now, I've got time uh, for uh, two or three questions from the floor. Um, I would ask questioners that you be uh, concise and succinct in your questions and, and offer questions rather than statements. Um, <laughs> if I could ask Joe Skrinski from Champ Equity, uh, I believe, has a question. Thank you, um, Prime Minister. Um, and first of all, to commend you on your first year role, call, role uh, report card, which you uh, I think you've taken on some he's, very... He's writing it. <laughs> so, uh, just, I hope just, David gives you the right mark. Wait till it comes out. Um, I'm actually speaking for the Australian Venture Capital Association in, in raising this issue, and that is a capital markets issue. We've talked about the fragility of the international capital markets. We also know that Australia doesn't create enough capital to satisfy its own capital needs. We have a huge development task ahead of us. In the listed uh, capital markets, we don't have a problem. But that's pretty much the fast money that moves in and out. 
where we do have a problem is in the unlisted direct investment area, where the money comes from uh, superannuation funds and institutions both in Australia and overseas. We don't have an internationally competitive product to allow the pooling of these monies for the long-term investment in infrastructure, private companies, um, and uh, property. Uh, it's an issue that's gone around in circles with various government departments for many years now, and nobody's been able to really grasp it and solve it. Is this part of your idea of financial sector reform in the future? Look, uh, I, I can understand that from the point of view of uh, uh, people with uh, a great deal of expertise, uh, people like you, uh, there's the perception that this has uh, you know, raced around government for a long period of time because it's not, not a new discussion. I absolutely acknowledge that. I, I think, to be fair, as we've seen uh, the global financial crisis uh, and needed to work through... Uh, a, you know, we already had a better regulatory structure and the fact we had a better regulatory structure showed uh, in the days of the global financial crisis, but beyond the global financial crisis, we've needed to return to some regulatory questions. Uh, so that work has been done. Uh, but I can certainly assure you that both uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Treasurer Wayne Swan and Assistant Treasurer Bill Shorten are well aware of the issue that you raise uh, and the uh, potential constraints that it does put on uh, capital flows and are uh, uh, you know, do, doing the necessary uh, thinking work in this area. So I don't come with any uh, ready-made solution for you, uh, but I, I can... Uh, you know, tell you that it is a problem, an issue, uh, understood by government. Uh, next we have a question from Peter Winnecke from the Meyer Foundation. Thank you. Um, Prime Minister, despite um, staggering wealth in this country, uh, we have a tiny philanthropic sector. Um, I'm interested in uh, any plans the government has to assist build a cultural giving in this country. Uh, well, I think we've got some things to do on, on uh, you know, the not-for-profit sector that uh, Tanya Plebisek's doing, so better government engagement with the not-for-profit sector. Uh, on the, the question of philanthropy, there are some, uh, you know, regulatory questions, but really I think our role uh, is probably bringing people together uh, and using the, you know, sort of uh, power of advocacy that government can bring uh, to get people to think through uh, philanthropy issues. Uh, I did, uh, uh, during the course of this year, bring a series of people together for a discussion uh, to get a, a sense of the scale and depth of some of the things that are happening in America uh, where some amazing philanth uh, philanthropists uh, basically gift uh, you know, all of their uh, wealth or a large proportion of their wealth whilst they're still alive so that they can see the benefits of that uh, rather than the more traditional model of, uh, you know, the foundation that you gift into as part of your disposition um, at the time of your death. Uh, so I think there are some great models there and there was certainly engagement in the room about it and there are people uh, who have set up now and are able to provide advice about these giving strategies. But uh, for us it's, you know, going to be... Uh, a national uh, discussion where government can play a role, uh, but by its very nature it needs to be a much broader and deeper conversation than that to change uh, the way in which uh, people view uh, their own accumulation of wealth and then the use of it. And uh, last question from the floor from Brendan Dow of Ceramic Fuel Source. Prime Minister, um, I wrote my question down so I wouldn't waffle. Okay. But this is a, this <laughs> is a good story uh, for carbon. Um, because we're a company that actually benefits from a carbon price. But there are feeding tariffs in place for rooftop solar in Australia, but they're clearly not sustainable. West Australia announced this week they were shutting theirs down. New South Wales have scaled it back. And I'm told by the Energy Minister in Victoria that we're about to hit our cap. So there's a fuel cell system that ceramic fuel cells designed and built here in Australia, and it's smaller than a dishwasher. We can install it in your home and it can save four times as much carbon and generate six times as much power as a rooftop solar system. There are national feeding tariffs in Germany and UK and France and Netherlands for residential scale fuel cells. This is an issue which can't be palmed off to the states, which is typically the response we get. The federal